Let's start off by just saying the journey has ups, downs, and depending on, well, most of your actions, it will give you cutscenes that are worthy of being in a AAA title. I promise. You'd think, watching the story unfold of a footballing lad from London that you can make have a Stoke flag on his wall, if you feel so persuaded, would be rather dull. It's anything but. The journey really, truly pulls you in. The footballing world they have created, with special thanks to a few footballing consultants, really does feel authentic, with the only things missing being swear words, your manager being able to talk, any mention of the club you play for, or who you're up against in the context of the story, and your mum texting you. Instead, she tweets you. It's meant to be endearing. Sounds more like a forlorn lover. Weird! The richness of the world is obvious in the first cutscene, where your granddad, an ex-pro of an unmentioned club, Jim Hunter, is willing you on in your first game. We also get to see Alex Hunter's mum and dad in a clash that will set the tone for the rest of the story. Oh yes, spoilers. Spoilers, you have been warned. During the chat between me and Mr Metz, there will be spoilers. You have a tight friendship with Gareth Walker for the same time period. He's behind you all the way. <laughs> and the dialogue between you is genuine and feels like he has your back. <laughs> the kind of friends we all had when we were 11. This is most notable when you come across a former Phones for You salesman masquerading as a pro footballer known as Danny Williams. The almost certainly shiny suit wearing banterific bellend gives you a focal point of aggression in your exit trial. You'll hate him and his daft haircut for quite some time. After all that excitement, it's time to choose your club with your new agent, Michael Taylor. He comes across a bit like a sales manager of a call centre, and your granddad doesn't like the cut of his jib one bit. He actually does seem to be working in Alex's best interest, which seems to make Jim's reactions quite puzzling and unreasonable. Including one scene where he sorts you out of a new, bawling apartment, and your granddad, who up until this point has been the realist and grounded character, acts like you've just farted at his inevitable funeral in FIFA 18. I'm quite proud of that one. Yeah. On the subject of family, we have to talk about Alex Hunter's mum. She's the comforting, always there sort that looks like she's just been rifling through Ian Wright's wardrobe for his ill-advised leather trousers phase. She's never out of them. Luke. Bloody hell, she's probably the weakest character, but she shows signs of authentic care. A wrongly used plot furthering device, and perhaps limitation of presentation at this moment, means that she tweets you incredibly cringy tweets as referenced before, like text messages. Can you imagine the absolute pasting Alex will be getting in the dressing room? And I don't mean from the good cop, bad cop, totally added in to make the script easy to progress, Lily Bernard and Toro. The Spanish Daily Blind is a respectful, kind one that wishes you well and tweets. Again, why doesn't anyone use fucking WhatsApp? And then you've got Bernard. He's French and he's rather bloody swarmy. What would a football team be like without an arrogant twat who isn't that good anyway? I'm thinking of you, Mr. Tarapt. Speaking of arrogant twats, wait till you see some of the shy Gareth Walker tweets you. Word of warning, he turns into a 13 year old bully who blatantly fancies you. The only thing he doesn't do is treat you asking for your dinner money or say, your mum. It may sound like I'm complaining. After all, my first comment about FIFA 17 was how shit I thought it was. An opinion that is changing around as we speak. It's true. But anyway, I'm not. Of course, the journey is not perfect, but it does have a genuine fantastic mix of story, well-executed dialogue for the most part, and an authentic world that you feel part of straight away. Victories feel as important as foot cut wins, and seeing Alex Hunter's reputation with the manager go down truly feels like a personal slight on you. Add all this together and you have one of the most engaging modes added to FIFA ever, and without question, the best attempt at a football adventure game Ever. Yes, it's better than Captain Tsubasa, you hipster Japanese wannabes. That was never that good. It was always a good concept. The EA execution is so polished that it does make the journey a pleasure to play through, and given its mix of skill games and scenarios, it's a must-play for any FIFA 17 beginner. Yeah, any it's on one Alex season. Ends on a cliffhanger, though. Now time yeah, to join me and Metz as we discuss uh, all things the journey. The Footstock, where we discuss all things FIFA, Ultimate Team, and a little bit about the journey. This is the journey episode. I am Matt Aguilera. And I am Matt metz Lamborn in corporate colours. Yes, anybody think he was an EA shill, but he's just doing this because he loves it, believe it or not. 
This is Messi's passion, wearing as much FIFA 17 gear in there. I think, in fact, 80% actually has FIFA in the, in the, time, in the screen. <laughs> Yeah, well, let's just stay for disclosure. This isn't a sponsored episode or anything like that. <laughs> All the boxes Even... around me, uh, I got for free from the manager of my local game store. So thanks, Al, for that. Much appreciated. No, I, I bought this because I thought it was kind of cute. Epic, epic shout out there. I like it, Mets. So, Mets, we've got plenty to discuss after that um, strange uh, journey intro. There's something new we've tried this this time along. But. The one thing we've both been saying via Twitter, we're, we're both on Twitter, I am Matt underscore Aguilera, and Matt, you are? At Lambo Matt, and of course, don't forget to follow us on at Footstock, so you can get updates of when our new shows are out and just general FIFA banterific goodness. Lovely, yes. I like it. So, Matt, where do we start then? Well, if we're going to start out here, we do need to say, once again, there will be spoilers from this point on, here on in, so... We can't guarantee that all the chat is not going to have some kind of spoiler. Um, the first one we should probably say is that the FIFA 17 journey mode is one season only. When you get to the end of the season, it doesn't continue. You're not allowed to continue. You get a reward, of which we won't spoil, I don't think. And um, you go from there. That is it. So, Mets, you've played a season. You were Alex Hunter. You hung out with his granddad and his mum and his only friend in the world, it turned out in the end anyway, uh, Danny Williams. What did you think of it? Oh, that was a massive spoiler. Um, yeah, a massive spoiler. <laughs> right, well, let's put it into some context before we just sort of get into the specifics. So when we found out about the journey, I was very sceptical. One, because I don't like playing offline. And two, it kind of looked like they were going to make FIFA into an almost like a GTA sort of life story mode. Um, I thought, respect for doing something a little bit different, but this looks corny as hell. And let's, let's just say right now that the journey is pretty corny. That said, I don't think it's that bad. That said, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I thought I was just going to like try it out a couple of hours, get bored, and then go back to playing Ultimate Team. But I finished it over the open weekend, so I've played at this point more journey than I have Ultimate Team, which is a bit of a shock. And yes, me too, actually. I wish I had the staying power to have finished it in one go, like I would have done like five or ten years ago, perhaps. Um, unfortunately, real life always intervenes, so I had to do it in like two or three attempts. And you just got to really hold your hands up and go, EA, well done. That's not to say it's perfect, and I'm sure later iterations of this are going to be a lot better. But for a first go, this really hits the mark. And I found myself way more emotionally mm. attached to Alex Hunter than I thought I was going to be, specifically being an old white boy and then being a young black kid or mixed race kid. I found myself relating to him very, very easily, which really shocked me. And it was my intention when I started my journey that I was going to deliberately be a dickhead. I wanted to make all the fiery decision choices and just basically become a big sulk. But because I was so invested in Alex, I found it very difficult to keep continually pissing off the manager and saying rude things to the press and stuff. It's like, no, I want to actually progress him properly and for him to be universally like, not just by a few dickheads on Twitter. So, yeah. I think you said it when you said you were surprised that I even was interested in the journey. And yeah, yeah, it's very much. Lo and behold, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, it would be nice if there were ways to integrate it into the online gaming aspect, but maybe that'll come in, in latter years. But top marks for me. It was really, really enjoyable. I think that it's a fantastic story. It is corny in places for the things that we've outlined in the intro. But they are really are nitpicking for the for, on the whole. Ninety percent of this is really really good. It's got a good story arc. Um, you've got a you've got a good villain to pour out some aggression on, and the turning of him turning heel, um, your friend Gareth Walker is one of the best parts of the game. And you do get sucked into that aspect of it, and it's not like you don't give a shit about it. It's not like a really rubbish. Um, second-rate GTA, like you said, where you know they cobble together a story. You're meant to care for a character, 
you've only seen for the past 30 minutes. I remember a very good example, actually. This is a spoiler for most people. For Mad Max the game, which I think is amazing. I'd give that easily an 8 or 9 out of 10. But you fall in love with a girl at one point, and then she dies. And you just do not give a flying fuck. Mm. Like, you just don't care, because it's just like, it was so poor, she was so poorly written, and she comes in and out, but you don't have any of that in the journey. It's relatable. Like, for example, uh, Jim Hunter and his family. All of his family are quite are very real. And Jim Hunter's like many granddads out there, who somebody who's into football, and he's, a, he's an ex-pro of an, un an unmentioned club, of course, because it's your favourite club mm. if you uh, sign for them, because he starts crying when he... Uh, which is a wonderful scene, by the way. That's one of my favourite scenes, you know. I know we're, we're really jumping around a bit, but my favourite scene of the whole thing is when you sign for the club that's your favourite club, so Man and Stoke, of course, which was, it felt a bit incongruent, the fact that Alex Hunter's going around saying, like, man damn and all that, and blooding in it and stuff. And then he's, he's got a Stoke flag up. As like, I played for the guy in Barstool or something, years or something, because it just seems more authentic that way, but... Um, when you sign for Stoke, um, Jim Hunt is actually crying and says, for the proudest day in my life, you signing for my old club. Uh, implying that, was, that your favourite club is because um, G you, your granddad used to play for them. I liked all that bit. And I think that, like, one of the things that I thought was, well, it's kind of cute, really, but it, it didn't quite hit the mark in some ways, but the ending of their story was quite good. The, the interaction between Michael Taylor, the agent, and Jim Hunter. A lot of the time, I was just like, why is Jim being such a knob to you? He's, give, he's giving him loads of money. And the bit with the, in the apartments is like, why are you being a dick to him? And he starts saying, oh, um, by the way, you're not family. Don't forget that and all this kind of stuff. It was, like, it was, just, it was just so uncalled for. Is he, is, he mm. trying to, is he trying to say that basically he's from an older generation and doesn't get it and that kind of stuff? I don't think it's that. I think it, it's highlighting the difference between an older generation in what football is today because they're two very different things if we we try and think what football was like in jim hunter's days it was all about the glory camaraderie of your mates going for a beer uh, after the match having a smoke at half time and getting True. money to basically buy a, a loaf of bread and take your wife out once a week probably now it's like everyone's trying to get into football to lead a celebrity lifestyle which is something that Jim Hunter doesn't relate to. He doesn't like it when, for instance, there's a scene where the agent comes around with a pair of Adidas boots. Oh, like, I picked the white ones. Yeah, I picked the white ones. No, I picked the white ones. No, I picked the white ones. Yeah, I'll try to keep it old school. Um, so he's like, oh, we didn't get this kind of stuff in our day, basically like scorning the fact that you're having to do work on top of playing football, all the promotional aspect, all these extra revenue sources. Basically, the money didn't mean a thing to Jim Hunter. So he's weary of the fact that someone's trying to introduce uh, a love for money into Alex's world rather than just a love of the game, which has basically got him to the point where he is at that stage. Just love of the game, wanting to play football, be like his granddad. And now money is starting to influence him a little bit. Yeah, I, I think that's a very, very well put together, actually. I think you're right about that. But I was still like a bit, I've still found it a bit grating that it's like Michael Taylor is not a bad agent. He's not trying to do anything funny, and he's actually the best interest of his clients all the time. They were never going to have a dodgy agent in it. That's never going to happen. Perhaps they, they will do in a later version. There'll be some kind of conflict of an agent who tries to get you to sign with him and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, yak's impeccable with Alex Hunter. And I guess, like, like you say, he's just more worried about it, money getting to him and him not performing well. It'd be very interesting to see what happens when he perform badly and see how Jim Hunter reacts. I'm sure you get some kind of intervention from him. There's some, there's some more experimentation that we need to do, isn't there? Because we, we, we just played through it with great enthusiasm and didn't like try and experiment with what would go wrong and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm sure on different playthroughs, if you play in different positions, that sort of thing, if you lose a big result, if you don't score for so many games, you get dropped because you're pissing off the manager, that sort of thing. Because basically, for people who haven't played through the journey yet, there's a... a kind of like a popularity bar in the game, isn't there, whereby based on the decisions that you make with uh, press conferences and that kind of thing, determines your, your standing with fans and the manager. And sometimes the two counteract each other. So if you say something that makes the fans happy, it pisses off the manager and vice versa. So the idea is to try and be in the middle as much as possible. Um, and if you make the wrong decision by the manager, there is a consequence is that he will drop you from the starting 11, put you in the reserves, or even take you out of the reserves. 
like I said, I was so invested in Alex that I didn't want that to happen. So I was pretty much in the first team the whole time. Um, but it would be interesting to see what other routes of progression there are within the game and the story and the different cutscenes that are unlocked if you start making bad decisions or your form is really bad. Because there must be a lot of content in there that even though we finished the game, we haven't seen yet. Oh yeah, there'll be plenty of that. Um, I, I guess my IGA didn't go too badly. Uh, apart from there was a massive glitch in it that I'm really annoyed about. And I think it, it did spoil some um, of my enjoyments, which is that once we started to get a really good run to it towards the end of the season, I was stoked and we could have got a Champions League place. But it misinterpreted that as saying we could go for the title. And then we had a very good speech made by the chief executive of the, of the club, who's a woman. Um, I don't know, I'm, it is relevant because you see her early on in some cutscenes, but she comes out as a, a person saying it. it. It's very inauthentic because obviously the manager who's saying this to you, the manager is mute, which is a bit weird. Yeah, um, Tyler's Mark Hughes walks into the dressing room and just looks like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but like you know, he's not saying anything, he's just sort of nodding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he walks in and he's just like literally, his lips don't even move at all, he just walks in going, like a, like a flower pot man, just not getting involved whatsoever. It looks like as if he's trespassing and he's in the wrong <laughs> game. Yeah, maybe. Like, literally, he's like, oh, sorry. <laughs> I need to go to the flower show, isn't it? Was puts the shoes, boy. What's that jacket? <laughs> yes, the nice jacket that caught. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, so there is that bit, and that is awkward. And... I wish we hadn't, didn't see the managers. I just think it would be like, it, it, it kind of cheapens the authenticity a little bit, but what are they going to do? Get every single manager coming and do a line? Like, it's not going to happen, is it? It's just, just, in, just do generic, no one gives a shit. Like, just some generic voice actor would have been fine. I like the early scenes whereby you can see your manager on the touchline making decisions when you're on the bench. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the decisions of the manager is interpreted through your coach who is fully voice acted. And I like that. That was kind of dramatic. It was almost like the, the manager is unattainable to you. You've got to go through this guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's he's, he's going to pass on his decision to play you or not. And that was kind of cool. But when you get into the first team and you're exposed to the manager a lot more, but you can't interact with him, that, that is a little bit yeah. disappointing. I mean, you don't even get... Um, this, this should really have changed the Twitter thing to two apps. One that was text messages and one that was... Um, at mentions on Twitter because you know you get messages from your, your teammates like as if they've texted you let alone what your mum tweets you which is so cringe it's so like it just doesn't look right hashtag you deserve it yeah hashtag you deserve it was if your mum would be doing that but his his mum is um, she seems like rather young doesn't she I suppose and there's, there's... <laughs> what are we implying there <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm just saying she seems young, so she'd probably she probably a high school pregnancy. <laughs> Is Alex Hunter putting it, uh, Alex Hunter's dad putting about in places he shouldn't have been? No, he's a bit of he's 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 well. Uh, oh, we should talk about our dynamic actually. The uh, the dad, the absent father, the, the always there mother and me. It wasn't it wasn't really explained why Alex's dad is, is non-present. It just gives you that little bite at the beginning where he's not impressed of how you're playing. He's been overly harsh when you're a child and you, your mum basically tells him to fuck off. And then he basically stays yeah, fucked right. <laughs> right up until you're 17 years old. Yeah, and then, he, then he turns up again um, and it doesn't go anywhere. But the one, the, the thing that I love about it is talking about that intro scene. That intro scene is so real. I, did think I, I really love, they, they work really hard on that intro, you can, and you can tell, it pays its dividends, it really sucks you in. The bit when it goes, is that, that close-up of Jim Hunter's face, and then he's like, go on, Alex, like that, and he's like, and then he's turned around to his, well, Jim Hunter's turned around to his dad and saying, see, I told you as a player. Like, you, that's a very real thing that happens to people, I mean, I know it. You, you, you hear about it, that people had that kind of thing happen for him. People were around there willing him on, and he had his dickhead dad, who was a failed pro, of course, who had his injuries cut short, which adds a bit of texture to the story. Um, he was obviously probably a bit jealous of Alex actually being successful as a young lad and going going through things. Um, but I think that rather than... In, I don't know. Some part of me thinks it's like... 
as much as I love the journey, it's it seems to be a very atypical story of a lad who didn't have a dad and his granddad steps in and you know he goes on and achieves great things and his dad tries and gets back and all this kind of stuff. Um, but then again, how relatable would the story have been of a a lad from a middle class family? <laughs> with a nice mum and dad who seem quite normal. I, I don't know how much of a, how, how that would have sucked you in in the same way. Be Patrick Bamford, basically. Mm. <laughs> That's like that. I mean, here's one thing I'll throw at you. I think the dad becomes almost irrelevant right from the beginning. Okay. Yeah, very true. He's a... I think they could have been a bit braver and done it as a single parent story with the supporting granddad. So that isn't around, mum takes you to the football. And which is a, it's a true story for a lot of people. That's not unusual. Yeah, of course it is. And which makes it the, the female character even more remarkable then because she, she's moral support, but really it's the granddad who's sort of dragging him through the thick and thin to get him to be a pro. Whereas if it was mum taking him to lads and dads every week to try and improve him, and, and the absent dad isn't there. And then when dad eventually does turn up on the scene towards the end, it's more dramatic then. Oh, it's my dad. I've not seen him now to him. Pro, he wants to know who I am all of a sudden. Fuck off. Yeah, yeah, no, I can see where you're coming from there. Um, but I think also, I don't mind the way it was done, really. The more I think about it, uh, uh, it it's our job to critique things and talk about it, honestly. But the more I think about it, the more I actually think it, it wasn't that bad of a decision to to do it that way. I do like your story art better because you hear about it quite a lot where pro footballers get a like, professional contract or something good happens to them and then an absent father just turns up out the blue. That does happen to them. Now here's one thing I don't know if you, you thought about or, or tested but you know you were saying about the Twitter thing being a bit annoying and mm. some very generic Twitter handles in there and if you <laughs> you can search for those people and they don't belong to EA they are like genuine normal people's Twitter handles, they have to ask for permission to use oh, them. Right. And maybe they got some money for it or a gift, I don't know, or maybe it was just literally, yeah, you can do that, not a problem. Um, but <laughs> some of the people whose Twitter handles have been used are getting a hell of a lot of abuse off you know, the scummier side of the game oh, community, which is really funny. That's so harsh. But yeah, what, fancy just using generic at Catherine Hunter and expecting people not to search for it to see if it was real. Because it's it's so normal that it was bound to be taken. So why couldn't they have just like created Catherine Hunter 19218 or something and they just had their own parody account? I really don't know why. It's a very good point. Um, for somebody that takes a big interest in social media and its failings and its, um, and its positives, I don't understand this part of the project why they just say, right, these are 25 Twitter accounts we're going to use as part of the, the context of the story. We owe, owe them all for real. And you could just tweet you three things from there. Like, well, you could just use that as a guerrilla marketing campaign. I mean, I've just got onto um, Catherine Hunter's Twitter right now. It's just normal woman's Twitter. Why would you do that for? Yeah, it doesn't make so a whole stupid. lot of sense. I think a parody account would have been good. And then people could have followed it. And it could have drummed exactly. up viral stuff or keep you attached to those characters if and when they likely do a sequel. Yeah, and, you know, of course, <laughs> Jim Hunter, if he was on Twitter, is he by FIFA 18 or 19, his avatar will change to a coffin with, a, a, with, his, football, <laughs> with his leather football on top of it that he gives to Alex hmm. with um, a, a Snapchat little filter on the, on the bottom from Alex I was saying, God, can't believe you're dead in it or something. Yeah, blood. But anyway, yeah, that's so an interesting point you just brought up there, which is, of course, the mythical yeah, old football, cool. which is almost like this sort of, oh, like kind of source of power and inspiration for Alex. And yeah, it's, it's a powerful relic for the game. For people who don't know and haven't got to this stage yet, uh, Alex has what looks like an old 60s football, so really tough old leather, brown football, uh, that he takes with him everywhere, like puts it in the locker room and touches it before every game for luck because it reminds him of, of his granddad and what he's trying to, to rise to become. Mm. It's a nice touch and it causes a, a tiny bit of conflict in the game whilst people try to understand what it is that he's doing but eventually they come round to his way of thinking and they all get inspired by this ball which is great. Um, it seems very simplistic on its face value 
but it turns out to be a very special part of the game, doesn't it? Yeah, it does actually. I'd say that the bit when you go out, I think it's for the uh, you get to the FA Cup final if you want to get there and if you're good enough, I suppose. But when um, the guy, the, the two characters that are added for scripting and for Gallo helping, is Bernard. yeah, uh, yeah, Gallo, Gallo, or Toro as he calls himself, and Lily Bernard, they when you both walk out, they both touch the ball before the FA Cup final. And I love that bit. I was like, oh god, it's got yeah, me really. That was a really powerful moment because they're all kind of like taking the piss out of you for doing that up until that point, and then they're all like, what oh, you're doing really well, and we want to do as well as you with the touch of the ball because there's something in this. And what did you? Sorry, go on. No, that, that was it. What were you going to say? Oh, right. yeah. What I was going to say is, what did you think of Lily Bernard and Toro then? I actually really liked them. I thought they, I thought it really worked in the story. I like the it's characters. Very... Um, I barely saw uh, Gallo in the game. Yeah, but Bernard plays all the time. But Bernard he? interfered with my team enormously like because he's absolutely shit. Yeah, he is. And I don't know about you, but I never scored with him despite trying many times. I, I started to think... I'm not allowed to score this player. So we, I had to use him exclusively as a link player because he just couldn't finish against like gold caliber keepers. Like he was always hitting tape shots or blasting them over the bar. I had a few near misses, but I was convinced that uh, I was conspired against when I was in control of Bernard that he just couldn't score. I have scored in him, but I haven't scored many of them. The fact that he's got a number nine shit pissed me off and he's a midfielder. Yeah, because if Bit being Stoke, it fudges up the numbers, doesn't it? Because um, he's number nine, which makes Harry Kane number ten. Because you signed Harry Kane, we'll get into oh, yeah, that yeah, bit a little bit later. Which means Marco won out of it. She was Stoke's number ten, he's number twelve, and that just pissed me off. Oh so yeah, totally. Then he gets number twelve. I was annoyed with that. I saw that happen. But that's an interesting thing. I wonder what happens if you sign for Spurs. You can't sign Harry Kane, can you? So maybe they sign Hammers or... Oh, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? See, this is a good excuse to play through it again to see what these little quirks are. Yeah, yeah, so I, I, a good point. But what happens is, um, as part of the story arc, after a few games for Stoke where you'll be put on the bench and you'll come on, um, whether you do well... Do the whole Marcus Rashford thing, don't you? They bring you on as a super sub, you score a few goals, you start to get... Uh, people's attention they're clamoring for you to get in the team and then all of a sudden what you're about to say mm. he calls into the coach's office and he just says you're going out alone here's some clubs who want you and i had a choice of but i think you had the same norwich aston villa and newcastle yes yes i had the same yeah yeah and i chose aston villa i chose newcastle um i chose villa just because I was, uh, this is how stupid this is. It wouldn't matter which one I picked, but I chose Villa. <laughs> I realised, because obviously... <laughs> oh, this is this, this better be good I, after all this. <laughs> I chose Birmingham. It's, it's only good because it's a fucking game. I chose Birmingham because I thought in my head, oh, I live in Stoke now. So Birmingham's not that far away, and Birmingham's close to London, so I can get close to... That's perfect. That's a really shit decision. <laughs> oh god. Just like that, um, yeah, so I went to the villa. And then when you get to the villa, you'll see Danny Williams from your exit trial. He gives you a bit of banter. But actually, um, you strike up a good friendship that becomes... Um, again, it's an authentic friendship that you have, especially the bit of banter you have about um, FIFA Ultimate Team where the ratings get come out and... Alex oh, love that. Him. That's so good. Such yeah. a clever scene. Yeah, he's got 65 and like Alex, Alex, um, sorry, Danny Williams has got, he's got 50 or 60, I can't remember yeah, now, is it? 50, yeah, he's shit. Yeah, <laughs> and he says, oh, mate, I, I rang him up and told him, put it like that so I could just level up later on and all that. And he actually becomes a really good character, Danny Williams. He's, he's very one-dimensional at first, like blatantly quite jealous of him, giving it all that. Um, but that's a surprise that he turns around and you actually become good friends with him. But then Gareth Walker becomes the biggest knobhead ever known. I honestly with... didn't see it coming, you know, and it's that's not. why it really affected me quite deeply because I didn't kind of like look at him. I thought he looked like a snivelling, like, sort of wet back looking Spencer FC. <laughs> so, like, I didn't really, <laughs> didn't really like him from the start, to be honest. And, like, I don't think Alex Holmes would be hanging around with this lad. Because one of them would be living in Islington and the other one would be living in Brixton. But anyway, so <laughs> I don't think these two would get on. But anyway, so you start off the game 
best of chums. You come through the ranks together. And at the start, Gareth's keeping you out of the team, isn't he? And then you get your big chance where uh, you get subbed on for Gareth, even though he scored a goal and you have to make a big impact in that game. I think it's against Chelsea, if I remember right. And um, of course, he's joined the same club as you when you select your pro contract, and I think that happens every single time, regardless. Yeah, yeah, you sign for the club again. Eventually, um, he gets pissed off because you're getting into the team, and puts in a, a transfer request like, after six months of, of signing for the club, which is ridiculous. Yeah, and and the best little part about that scene is the coach turns around and goes, and not only that. We've accepted an offer from our rivals. <laughs> like, so I'm like, what? Paul <laughs> Dale? That's what I'm saying, Lord. You fucking nutty. And then I realised, I thought, oh, it's going to be West Brom. So as yeah. if you'd leave so for West Brom. Oh, sorry, West Brom fans. Oh, you wouldn't know, would you? Well, we didn't have a choice, but anyway. But yeah, it's, it sets up an interesting dynamic from, from that point on. And you become bitter rivals at that point. But there is a glimmer of hope. Not too far into the, after he's transferred, I think it might be the game where you, the first match you play against West Brom, yeah, and you, you bump into him on the way out of the stadium, and he's almost trying to reconcile until Danny Williams turns up and he's like, "You've made a new Bezzy, fuck off! I don't want to know." <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just, don't hang out yeah, he comes past his Range Rover, doesn't he? He's Danny Williams, doesn't he? He's like, he's all like dead sound, like, oh yeah, you can all come for dinner if you like. And he's just like, yeah, I don't want to hang out with you two anyway. And they're just like, yeah. yeah. And then Gareth Walker turns into like the biggest child bully ever, going with his tweets, literally, with how sensitive Twitter are about tweets. Uh, he'd get banned instantly. Yeah, he ribs you every game, doesn't he? Like saying, "Oh, well, he's in the, in the first team. Maybe he'll actually get to play against me later in the season." And all this shit. It's like, fuck it, I want a prick. Absolutely horrible. And um, I thought I was going to say now. Um, yeah, about about the game that you play against in the first time round. Now, I didn't concede a, a hell of a lot of goals during the journey. I must admit, but in fact, when I, when I played the first time against West Brom, who was my rival team. They seemed really good, and yeah, yeah, Gareth mate. Walker scored against me Ooh, mate, that's with horrible. a header against Ryan Shawcross. And I'm like, there's no way you would win that. Like, every other time, Shawcross is clearing this ball, but somehow Walker goes in and just massively overpowers him. It's like, that's got to be scripted, but I'm not entirely sure if it was. But yeah, I was winning one nil, and then he scores his late header to, to draw, which seemed to suit the arc of the game, or the pot, I should say. Uh, but at, at that point, it's sort of equaling your ability. Like you score, I score. We're equal at this stage. So it's to me, it felt really scripted because like there's no way you can win that edit. So I was just wondering how how it went down in your rival match. I think I'm pretty certain I beat West Brom, which is why I thought he came out and tried to reconcile with me because I I beat him. So perhaps not. That's probably just. What happens no matter as long as you don't get a loss. We'll have to find out, won't we? There's somebody on YouTube who's put the videos in. I'd love to look into more of it and see what happens at certain points. Mm, yeah. So where do we sort of go from there? So essentially when you sign for your, your chosen club, you're given an objective and how you get your, your sort of season bonus, don't you? So with Stoke it's to try and break into the top six, but there's other zeros as simple as avoid relegation, someone to win the league, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So you're basically playing every game and you're also completing training once a week. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the interesting part of this, and this is where the journey really triumphs for me, is that one of the first things that we did when we got FIFA 17 is encourage people to do training because there's, there's subtle, so much has changed. subtle differences that are making a big difference to how the game I mean, it's familiar but different at the same time. And if you just go online and try and play it after playing FIFA 16, you're going to get caught out. So training, unfortunately, is a must. You know, I, I don't like picking up instruction books and trying to find out how to play a game. Yeah. If you do the training, you're going to get caught short. Like the journey triumphs because essentially it is an interactive training mode. Yeah. And it, put, it puts you through weeks and weeks of training whilst getting, getting you to play some matches at the same time to complete the story. But by the end of the journey, you should be pretty good at everything. Yeah, because you so many skill games. 
and some of them are really, really good as well and helpful. I found it very, very useful. I'm really pleased that uh, they included so many skill games and you have the opportunity to pick them as well on certain days. They give you like a free training day where you can pick your drill and go from there, work on stuff that you want to work on. Um, so it really how you, you, you do everything, defending set pieces, the lot. And obviously you need to do all this because the set pieces, I'm starting to get my head around, but I still think they're awful. The only benefit for the set pieces is that you can loft in a ball or you can drill a ball in now. That's the only benefit I can see, but translating that into success has been very difficult so far. But at least with the journey mode, I've had an opportunity to get to know it better. And of course, the penalties. <laughs> yeah. Which is really funny bad. because you start the game off with a penalty. That's yeah, I, start scored that. I still haven't scored a penalty on the journey. What, have you been training? Um, oh no, I've scored a penalty. I mean, I won a penalty shootout today. I mean, I'm, yeah, I've played the journey, the beginning of it at least twice. Um, uh, once on PC and once on a uh, Xbox One. And each time I just couldn't score the penalty. I was like, oh, so hard. I mean, really, really hard. Yeah, they are hard. I came up against somebody in a penalty shootout and they just couldn't do it either. So between the pair of us, we're just like, I described it on Twitter as like two geriatrics playing walking football. It was <laughs> just just what it was like. like mm. I liken it to trying to zip up a coat when your hands are frozen. <laughs> like you know when your hands are so cold, but you need to zip up to stay warm, but you just can't do it. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. I still in Canada. It happened every morning. Right. Um, so you're not on talking about so. I managed to get to a point where I can just about stick them in the top corner, um, but I doubt I'll be able to do it every time because the, the margin for error is tiny now, whereas saving penalties isn't any harder than it was in FIFA 16, but taking them well Very on. true. Yeah, that's the other thing that's a bit annoying as well when it comes to the penalties, that they are, they are very easy to save. Like It's not that difficult. You just have to pick a direction. That hasn't changed. But the way to score them is like so much harder. I guess it's meant to give some kind of variation and gives. Oh, I can't. I just don't get it. I don't get why they changed it. Still don't. Um, Sorry, pointed out on our YouTube comments. Forgot your name. Apologise. But um, they made a good point. But, you know, sometimes to go forward, you have to just try things differently. And and I reconciled that. But basically, to make some few things and move forward, you have to make mistakes. I think the penalty system is a mistake, as it stands. Hmm. I think if they tone down the sensitivity, it could work. Um, but what, of the, um, the actual direction when you're shooting? Yeah, because you barely have to move it to completely miss. So if they tone that down a little bit, it has a chance. And it adds a bit more variation to the outcome of the penalty shootout. Because most people tend to find where there's some sweet spots that are almost impossible to save. Uh, penalty kicks from. With this, th there's so much 360 degree on well, it. Well, it's 180 because it's one sided, isn't it? But like, there's almost a full range of 180 degrees where you can slip the ball rather than just certain diagonal segments. And That's right. just, you, you don't have a bar, so you can't see where you're putting it. Uh, and that combined with the sensitivity, it ultimately leads to disappointment most of the time. Um, so if they're going to keep the bar hidden, they need to just tighten up the sensitivity just a little bit, and then I think it'll be okay. Mm, that's a, a good shout, actually. Well, of course, talk about the journey means we do discuss aspects of FIFA 17, but one of the things I'd like to talk to you about the journey is, what's the most unforgivable thing about the journey? We've, we've said lots of good things, we recommend the mode, we definitely say play it, mm. but it's not perfect. So what's the most unforgivable thing, like the biggest oversight, you reckon? Um, for me, the... the the most frustration came, and this is a basic symptom of just playing offline, is that the, the, the CPU of 65% of the ball regardless, nothing that you do will affect the outcome of how long to keep the ball for. You just have to wait for your turn for possession. And that really fucking annoys me, to be honest. It's like, there's no point doing these defensive drills because I won't be able to tackle you until you're ready to give me the ball, basically. Which seems to be they play masterfully passing... And possession football up until the final third, and then they eventually just lump it 
which is just completely weird. But not until they kept it for several minutes, really winding you up. The AI in FIFA is absolutely terrible. I cannot believe people play the game offline. It's, it's so shite. And all the teams play the same. West Brom play the same as Arsenal. Like, so you say that, but I found there were certain instances where I was very impressed with how certain players played differently. Like, let's say, sort of slower type wingers, they would sort of turn to protect the ball and work the ball backwards and wait for more support before they carried on the move. Whereas if you passed it to someone like Zaha, as an example, they bombed with the ball. Like, they knew it was quick and they ran with the ball really, really aggressively. So that, that's cool. But yeah, it still doesn't make any difference to the outcome that I won't get the ball back until the yeah. he's ready to give it to me. But there's nothing like, for example, bloody left backs lumping the ball to a striker. It's either they pass, 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 and pass, or that's it. There's no long ball in the game at all. Yeah, yeah it's just awful. And this, this is the reason why we didn't play AI. Yeah, I think they're guilty of over engineering it. Like you say, there's going to be certain instances where there's a panic in the box. And the best thing to do is almost certainly just clear the ball, but they don't. They'll find like a, an eye of the needle driven past to a striker from their own penalty area. <laughs> it's like, yeah. well, I can't do anything about that. There's literally nothing I can do. I'll just wait five minutes for him to make a mistake and give me the ball. But you just can't tackle them until they're ready to be tackled. And that's what kills the, the actual playing the game aspect of the journey, uh, which is why I don't play offline because it's... It, I get no sense of satisfaction out of beating the CPU because I know it's letting me beat them. Whereas if I'm playing online, I have to earn that win. I have to outsmart somebody or outplay them. Can't do that against the AI. It's just programmed to, to give you a certain amount of the ball. And that's it. Yeah, it's, it's a shame that you have to play the AI. It'd be so much better if there was a way of incorporating the online world. The most disappointing thing for me of the, um, the journey mode was the ending. Isn't enough substance in it for me. It's the ending that I got is probably the same as what you got. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. Yeah. So we win the FA Cup. We go yeah. home. We're playing uh, FIFA with our mates. We get a phone call uh, from the coach saying, "Put the telly on." So we broke sports, sports news. Yeah. <laughs> SSN or SSN, and uh, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, yeah, you find out that you've you've made the England squad. So completing the the full circle of Marcus Rashford's career up until now, and uh, basically it sets it up for, for next year, doesn't it? So yeah, um, your achievement. You're gonna get, get into the World Cup next year. I mean, the Euros or whatever it is. You, World Cup, yeah. So you got your first really good season under your belt. You get an England call up. And it literally is the start of the rest of your career. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see multiple uh, story modes with Alex Hunter and various iterations of FIFA to come. Yeah, they're definitely going to carry on. The one thing I was disappointed by is actually something to do with the England call-up. At one point, I'd scored seven goals in about eight games for Stoke. I'm getting a call-up to England. No, you don't even wait till the end of the season to call me up, whether I'm 17 or not. I didn't even get call-up to the under-21s or the under-19s. Why didn't they include something about that? Like, just, like, something. Yeah, well, it's, it's a first go, so we can figure them things. But, yeah, logically oh, speaking, we should be under 17s, under 18s. Yeah, they're going for authenticity, so, you know. Yeah, true. Mm -hmm. They're for authenticity, so why didn't even you just, like, go to a, a meet-up with the squad and they say, we're not ready to pick you yet, but, you know, we see potential in you. Then you have a training session with the England squad. You, you could have done it that way, for example. Not rather than like I don't know. The, so there's all that part, and then getting called at the end of the season, and then of course there's no awards. So like he talks about, I expected at the end of the season to be included in the the team of this season for the Premier League or something. Oh, that would have been nice because there are instances that that whereby um, you get into team of the week, don't you? Which yeah, you have the, you have your card and everything, and you, yeah. you hold it aloft. Which is inaccurately a silver card is a seventy five rating. That pissed me off. How the fuck can EA get that wrong? Yeah. It's their one. fucking game. It's silver mm. with a seventy five rated card. None of ain't nobody listening to this right now would do that. No of them, none of them would make that mistake. True. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that annoys me and this is minor, but Alex Hunter is always gonna be five foot ten. 
and a speed merchant. Whereas I would like to play different styles. Like I would love it if I could be a target man mm -hmm. and be like a six foot four monster. Yeah, that would be good. I thought. Yeah, I know what you mean. Because essentially, the way the way the CPU plays, you always have to play counter attack. So when you get the ball, you try and get it to the hunter as quick as you can, usually with a free ball, and you just blast through centre backs because they just don't really do anything yeah, to stop you. Yeah. Um, everyone else in the team goes after you quite effectively on the rest of the pitch, but the centre backs are almost irrelevant. So yeah, you just find yourself beating the offside trap over and over again, score goal, which is fine and it's fun. Um, but I'd like to be able to score headers and stuff like. There's a training mode called headers and volleys, and uh, yeah, you, you start off. Um, the ball gets launched into you by a machine, and you're just outside, sort of, or in the penalty area, and you're trying to do like special volleys, so scissor kicks and stuff. And then a defender comes onto the pitch to try and stop you, and you have to start winning headers, and you just can't. You know, you, you can like win the occasional header by moving them out of the way, but yeah. you won't get enough on it to ever score. So you can never really do well in that, that training mode, and you can never develop Alex Hunter as an effective header of the ball. You basically got to keep the ball to, to feet. I have scored a couple of headers with him, um, but not many. And if you, if you toss in crosses to him most of the time, you won't win the ball. No. And um, one thing I did, as I played him as a left winger, that's a mistake. Playing as a forward, just forget about everything else. Nothing else matters, trust me. He's a striker. Get it done. Playing as left winger is shy. Did you also play as the team as well, rather than play as the... Just I, tried, I tried different ones, and I just couldn't get on with, with playing as Hunter. Yeah, it's shit played on your own, isn't it? I didn't enjoy that. So, yeah, I was always taking control of the team towards the end. And that's another thing as well, because... You, you're not the boss, you can't pick the team, and the, and the computer makes some illogical selections and substitutions at time. Like, I don't know how it works in your game, but my team was constantly playing 4 5 1. My team is also playing. And Glenn Wheeling was always the central defence in the field. He saw most of the ball, and he's fucking shit. And it was really annoying. I was like, I can't wait till the second half, and it automatically subs on and Bula. So the first yeah. time I saw his play with Gunnar Unit, it was utter shit in, in the game. He's good in the yeah, life, but yeah, he doesn't tra he's one of those players who doesn't translate. translate. He's not quick, he's not overly physical, he's just a workhorse, but that doesn't get you anywhere in FIFA. So yeah, it's annoying when you've got Glenn Whelan on the field, you don't want him there, and then you've got to put up with Bernard, who's fucking shit, occupying yeah. a very critical midfield position where you'd rather have someone like Charlie Adam or Athelai in. And, and they often get substituted on, but they rarely start. So there's little issues there, but they're, they're forgivable. It doesn't break the game or anything, but it does wind you up a little bit as you go through. Yeah, and I think the other thing is that um, I was always curious about how did it work out with you playing as a striker and Harry Kane being in the team? Because well, that's, that's it, you don't see him. He never, ever plays, so it kind of breaks really? him. Yeah, he doesn't that's... play a single game. You just Why? interact him with him. I... Why on earth didn't you just make it so that you play 4 4 2, even though it's not the, 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 the formation of the team or whatever? Surely it would be clever enough to think, oh, right, we've just signed Harry Kane, so we better play him. I will play Alex Hunter because he's in form as well, and this will be the. What do you think if it played as a four-four-one-one and you played as a CF? Yeah. That's not out the realms of possibility. I think deep down the game wants you to be Cam, a, a real high goal scorer in Cam, or, or like a, a second striker, so you can support Harry Kane and strike up a really good partnership with him. But um, I didn't see him apart from cutscenes and then training. Didn't, didn't play a single game. Didn't come on as a sub. Did you find it strange that Stoke could sign Harry Kane? Yes. Like, it, I don't know why we got. So then, they what they should do is have like someone you can sign for a big club, like say you Man United. If you sign Harry Kane, that would make sense. But yeah, if you sign United or, or Sunderland or Swansea, you need to sign someone a bit more realistic. So it's let's say, even if it was Adiak and Fenway, it'd be more realistic, and it was like people. <laughs> yeah, I just got to get started, didn't I? Yeah, so... Um, Beast mode on! 
that that was a bit of a broken element of the game and Harry Kane isn't the most um, charismatic in terms of what he does in his cutscenes. Like the, there's um, the scene when he first arrives, you catch him walking down the tunnel after he's left the manager's office and you approach him and you give him the option to basically like sort of welcome him or, or be a bit of a dick and saying you're ready for the competition, which is what I did. And he goes, oh, right, I didn't he get he sticks his chin out and goes, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> Yeah. And it's like, okay, is great. He, you can't talk for toffee. <laughs> Isn't it crazy how much Harry Kane sounds like Rio Ferdinand? Hmm, okay. <laughs> Honestly. I just can't help but think it's Haley Joel Osment grown up. <laughs> Haley Joel Osment looks a lot worse than Buddy Harry Kane does. Yeah, but you can definitely <laughs> see that's how Haley Joel Osment should have turned out. He should have yeah, like it's very Harry. true. He should have yeah, so Harry Kane. So there's some parts where the suspension of belief element comes into it, and the, none's greater than uh, the, the manager not speaking to you, which doesn't work once you get into the first team squad, which I completely agree with. Harry Kane signing for Stoke and or whichever club you decide to sign for, he just wouldn't. He wouldn't go from Spurs, the Champions League side, to a non-Champions League side, apart from Man United, which would be plausible, after all, with, with, their, with their statue. So... I've got to say that when you put all those things together, it might sound like we're complaining, but all we care about actually is about what happens next of it and that it gets improved. And we have to report on these things and we have to talk honestly about the moon as well. Because it's not all just, if you, you read a tweet from me, I'll say, it's great, you need to play it, but that doesn't tell the whole story. Yeah, it's basically like a, let's think of customer service. So if you're doing a good job, like the best possible job you could do. No one would ever ring you. Mm -hmm. But by the very nature of what customer service is, you only hear about things when something goes wrong. And therefore, everyone you talk to sounds like a dick and doesn't like what you've done. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about FIFA. And if it, everything was perfect, we'd just all we'd be able to say is FIFA 17 is great, go buy it. Uh, whereas we actually have some constructive things that we hope can be improved and make the game better. And it's us just talking from experience as we've played a lot of different FIFAs over the years. And overall, we love the journey. Um, but, it will, but it will be better next year, whether it's because they listen to us or listen to someone else. And if no one said anything, it wouldn't get any better. So, Absolutely. That's basically yeah. where it is. Yeah, great point. The thing I'd say uh, with the journey is that I would love to know your favourite character of the journey. <sighs> Good question. I kind of like Dino. Who's the your boss that you go to on loan? Oh yeah, Dino Agostini. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hello. It's very nice to see you, Alex. <laughs> Me, <laughs> Dino. Like, yeah, he's like, he's Gino De Campo basically. He's, instead of talking about ah, you want a pasta, he's he basically he's talking like, oh, I play you next week. It's all right. Uh, uh, when you join a new club, it is very hard to fit in. You do become for you. Yeah, basically your coach gives you almost no encouragement or any positive feedback. Whereas Gino from day one loves the fact that you're at his club, Newcastle, in, in my case. Uh, very uh, encouraging about getting you into the team and praises you a lot throughout the journey. So it's two very different perspectives there. And I just like Gino more as a character because I like the way Williams interacts with him. Like when you turn up at Newcastle and you're scared to open his, his door, and Williams just spots you and he's like, Oh, you went and see Dino? And he just like gate crashes in and goes, Hey, Dino, you got someone here to see you? Or just takes the piss <laughs> out. <laughs> Which is a great touch. Yeah, it humanizes him a lot more than your generic coach who's just a bit of a sort of military drill sergeant type character. Hello, I'm a Northern Drill Sergeant who likes gravy. I'm Tony Pewis, and today we're going to train really hard. We're going to knock a ball from here to here, and he can knock it down, and somebody else is going to score a goal. Ooh. I'm going to insert a clip here, actually, because uh, our friend of the show, John Namro, sent me a clip today of Tony Pewis about 20 years ago getting caught swearing in, in the dressing room, so I'm going to stick that in there just as an aside. Anyway. Oh, lovely. Lovely. Yeah, lovely indeed. My favourite character was Jim Hunter, believe it or not. Oh, God. I just thought he was a good granddad figure. He had some good stories. That's a nice bit of context of story. And I think um, him being the kind of bloke who encourages you from the first, 
from the off, and I don't know. You can I can relate to the granddad like in Alex's relationship. It was nice to see that kind of thing and the family element not being discounted. Although of course, um, Alex has no brothers and sisters, which seems a shame for him. I feel quite sorry for him. Mm-hmm. He's got Gareth, isn't he, the brother? Ah, he's got Gareth, isn't he? Yeah, yeah Gareth. Yeah. Live for Spencer FC, isn't it? Yeah, Spencer FC. Oh, that's well funny. Um, okay, so who is your... Who do you think is the weakest character? Probably... Probably Gareth. I mean, he, he's, a, he's a great villain, um, but he doesn't... No, that's unfair, because the whole thing uh, is, is, about, is about beating Gareth, essentially. So... Um, Mm, probably, probably Jim. I didn't like him. I didn't no, like you did, I didn't have a close relationship with my grandparents, so if you did, so maybe you're. Oh uh, right, I, I love my grandparents. You, you yeah, the character more than me. I just found it he's yeah. a badgering old codger, and I never saw him on TV, so he's no hero of mine. He can get fucked. It's interesting, but the one criticism I have of the journey in terms of script writing is how they make him. A, how they make him so hostile to Michael Taylor, who's only acted in the, Alex's best interest, is actually a good agent and not being ropey. Oh, it's like you use the weakest character, bar none. It's the girl who interviews you. <laughs> she is a fucking <laughs> idiot. The, way, the worst voice acting of the whole thing. Everybody else, I mean, so even Alex, Alex is more... Give me a comment about three points today. Well, like, totally generic questions. Alex. Uh, which you do tend to get over and over again, unfortunately. There aren't that many unique questions on the journey, so you're doing the same press conference over and over again quite a lot of the time. And um, <laughs> there's some really awkward reactions. Like, there's one question where it's like, she'll ask you something like, uh, how did it feel to score today? And you, you can make a, I think it's a, an icy cold reply. Whereby you basically say, um, oh, it, it felt really good at, that I give my team a chance to win every time I'm on the pitch, and then you do this awkward laugh afterwards, and you go, <laughs> uh, Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and it just totally doesn't flow with the conversation at all. And he pulls a really strange face, which, because your cue to talk is over, he just goes from laughing to a straight face. Like, really yeah, it's really true. <laughs> yeah, he goes like, oh, I was giving my team a chance. <laughs> I mean, it's quite comical. The other thing I would say, um, that is the weakest character, but one that's actually got scripted lines and does good dialogue. For some reason, I, I really dislike his mum, even though she's like quite caring and stuff, she's got the odd good line. I think it's all to do with the leather trousers. It really pisses me off that she wears leather trousers or wet leggings. They look like leather trousers to me, all the way through. Oh, she's trying I don't to understand. Yeah, pimp herself out there a little bit. She's still young enough to probably produce another little hunter. <laughs> and how she becomes a fashion designer overnight again. Oh, yeah, I'm a fashion designer. Oh, yeah, it's brilliant. I thought she was a bit of an ugly bitch, so she just wound me up whenever she was on screen. To be I, I couldn't be doing with it. And you couple that script writing um, element of her, and also those cringy tweets that she sends to her that genuinely do look like. A long lost lover trying to get back in touch with somebody. I probably send that tweet out to somebody. Yeah, it's it's awkward and it doesn't work, and people don't tend to have that kind of relationship with their mum. I don't think. So yeah. um, hashtag your mum would never say hashtag you deserve it. It's not happening. Yeah, yeah. Everything that she does is, is, is annoying throughout uh, a diet. Basically, she she's crucial to the beginning, but not too important thereafter. Uh, I, I, I think there's a lot of that. I think with the, the way the story arc goes and the way that it obviously it doesn't play out as a movie, I, I, I think that she was always going to be a bit inconsequential, really. It's just one of those things. Your granddad becomes in. Oh, no, that's not true. You get a lot of scenes with your granddad, don't you, at the house where he's like trying to get you to. It'd be just the same thing, basically, modern football trying to encroach on the way he's teaching you and he, he's resistant to it, whether it's. Your agent comes around with a contract or he comes around with a, a fashion job for you to do for Adidas. He just doesn't like anything new, basically. He doesn't like the fact you play video games. He doesn't like Twitter. doesn't like money. <laughs> He's just a bit of a grumpy old bastard, to be honest. <laughs> you really hate him, don't you, Jim? I, that first scene... When I, don't like, I don't like young people and I don't like old people. So if you basically, if you're not like sort of 10 years either side of my age, you can get fucked. 
<laughs> really don't want to do business. Well, you could relate to Alex Hunter as a 17 year old. Yeah, because we've all wanted to be Alex Hunter. Though. We've all wanted to be a uh, We've all probably secretly felt we were good enough. <laughs> 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 I was never fucking good enough. <laughs> good enough to play football professionally. That's hilarious. And that's for you. If the ever invented footballer put the goals at the corner flag, you'd have a chance. I've always drilled my shots to the left. Yeah, the always. You do like a big massive run up, you look like Gary Pallister running for a fucking. <laughs> I know, that'd be fun, Gary Pallister career mode. And this is a thing they could spin off and you could do a legend career mode, like the journey of. Oh! Carlos Valderrama or Oh, something. God, that's nice. What, which legend would you like to do the journey of? Ooh. Ooh, God. I'm spot you. Well, they've got to go to Italy, haven't they? That's the one thing. We've got to go to Italy. So yeah, basically, to if, if we say that this journey is testing the waters to see if people potentially would pay a bit more to have a localised version of the journey, because if you're Spanish or Italian, you don't want to play the BPL. God's sake. No, yeah, no, it's very So if they did it for some of the major leagues, so do it for Bundesliga, La Liga, Serie A, Liga Un, or something like that, maybe MLS to break the United States market, that would go down really well. I'd love to play all of them. I really would. And if I can be yeah, a legend, if, it... if I can be a legend, that would be even better. Can you imagine, you imagine being, that is the um, way Adrian Muto or something? Getting coped well, up can, <laughs> can sack from Chelsea. <laughs> Fiery. Uh... The fiery decision. Do you want to go and do some drugs? Il Mucho is ready for drugs. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Walk away. And then what would his mum be like? <laughs> would she be wearing leather trousers? <laughs> no. I won't get into that. I'll say something that'll get us banned from YouTube. <laughs> then, uh... <laughs> yeah, I'd love this to be a journey mode of a legend. So. If I had to say somebody, it's got to be somebody who moves to Italy. I can't think, oh God, please get me somebody. I'm trying to think of like it. Like the old people would love Bobby Moore's career mode, win the World Cup for England. Great. And then young ones would probably like to be Jamie Vardy. <laughs> oh, God. And if you can actually say that in the game, that would be beautiful. Yeah, that would be funny. I'm think, trying to think of a Serie A legend. I do say Sidney Samahalovic, but... Yeah, that'd be good. You'd, uh, but you'd have to be a defender, unfortunately, which most people wouldn't like. Yeah, they're not, they're not going to do defenders, are they? That's, that's no, but what they thing. could do, they could do, like, contracted ones of 10 games of uh, the career mode of them, where, like, for example, they're all, like, scenarios, and you get subbed on as soon as you have the and have to take three kicks. Four! <laughs> Just banging. <laughs> yeah, that would work, yeah. You have to take it's like free the, the time free kick to win the game or something. Yeah, yeah with Sidney Um I'm trying to think of a, a good career. Someone who's got around a bit and had to make transfer requests. How about Gaza? I'd fucking love to be Gaza. Obviously, have different like viewpoints. Ooh. Like, Ooh. if you be Gaza, when you leave when you leave Newcastle, you could either sign for Man United or Spurs. Bloody hell. There'd be so much to have to go into this, though, to make it work. You'd have to get all the old yeah. teams and stuff. That's the only thing. But an extra mode. If you did, did scenarios with, like, Gaza, where, like, he signs with Spurs and stuff like that, you have to play him in the... You have to play in the FA Cup final but not get injured. Like, avoid, yeah. avoid tackling Gary Charles, otherwise you, otherwise you die. <laughs> get yeah, over. Like, Breaking career mode where you must accurately cripple Harland first time round, otherwise you lose a year of your career. <laughs> oh my god, that's so funny. Yeah, there's basically oh, there's yeah. loads of potential for this. And this edition of the journey through 17 is the test bed, isn't it? Everything hanged on the reaction to this and I think it's been overwhelmingly positive. I've not heard anyone say anything bad about the journey so far. Uh, which yeah, means we've said some Cheek. Well, we're, we're not saying it's a bad game, we're just saying there's, there's things that can be improved, but overall we love it. Uh, no doubt I'll be back in, in FIFA 18, and how much they'll expand on it remains to be seen, because I think now that they all know that it's popular, they have to do it for other leagues. 
maybe if it's at the expense of doing a BPL one, make sure do it somewhere else okay. if they can only afford yeah, one league or something. for one league. Then maybe Alex Hunter will transfer to a different league if you're going to stick with him. So. Well, there's lots they can do with it, and uh, I'm excited to see where it goes, to be honest. <laughs> While you've been talking, Harry Kane, two hours ago, tweeted out, I'm going to retweet this, so you'll know when we recorded. I'm going to retweet the response as well, so you can, you can all see it. He basically said, love this game already. Who started their journey? FIFA 17, the journey. And someone's tweeted, how can you love it when you haven't even opened it, Harry, FFS? <laughs> I've just retweeted both. Brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. brilliant. Uh, yeah. That just sums it up for me. The internet but, uh, strikes back. Yeah, I, I, I love the journey. And to wrap that up, definitely play it. Um, just one little thing before we go. You may remember that I said that FIFA 17 was shit. I absolutely hated it and got loads of um, yeah, comments. You, you reacted very severely when you knew it was going um, to improve a patch. No. <sighs> Is, is that if I could choose, I mean, well, if I you could make things different, um, having played PES 17 made me more angry about it, I suppose, because actually PES certainly plays better out of the box than what no, FIFA no, 17 Matthew, is. You know, you're not allowed to play PES. We are a Ultimate Team FIFA podcast. You're not supposed to sample the delights of other, other no. games. What the fuck no, are you doing? <laughs> so, so, yeah, we did that, and I've Practice, 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 play the journey all the way through. And now I am starting to enjoy it a bit more. I do think FIFA 17 is very flawed in a, in a lot of things, but it's nowhere near as bad as I made out, or nowhere near as bad as I felt at the time when I was first playing it. And now I've got a bit more used to the dribbling, that kind of thing. I see what they're going for, but things like input lag and some nuance of the game still feel a bit rubbish, really, if I'm honest with you. But on overall, um, I'm starting to enjoy it a hell of a lot more. And one of the things I do love is that I haven't spent a penny this year. And I've still got loads of coins in the bank, figuratively speaking. I've got good, decent players that I can play decent matches with. And I absolutely love the squad building challenges. I can't stop doing it. Well, we're going to talk about that in the next full-length episode of Footstock. Um, but we're both in agreement that squad building challenges are mint. And you can effectively just toss off any old shit and trade it for good stuff, even if it's untradeable. But it just puts so many useful players into your club, it doesn't really matter. So yeah. that's a big win as far as we're both concerned and something we're going to talk about a lot more on the next episode of Footstock, definitely. Wonderful. So with that, Mets, that's the end of another show. Wow. Really? I I, di I didn't think, you know, when you said you want you to do an episode on the gene, I didn't think we would be able to talk about it quite as long as we have done, but we're both so into it. Yeah. It's quite right. interesting. Okay. What would you rate the journey out of 10 before we go? Ooh. Well, it's definitely better than a 7. I can't decide whether anyone... A 9 is a bit too high. I think I think a, a good solid 8 out of 10. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. And mm. I, I, I can't wait for it to come back. And I'm hopeful that they build on it and, and, and make it a 9 out of a 10. And it's not that far away from a possibility. Yeah, I think if I was feeling really generous because it's such a good first go, nine out of ten would be okay. the thing. But but purely on on its merit, eight out of ten is, is more realistic. It's got a couple of little things that can be bettered, but overall, really great experience. It probably took me, I'm going to say, the best part of twenty hours to complete. Yeah, I'm going to say about 15, 20 hours. When like you that. bolt that onto the, all the existing game modes, what a great bonus that is for the same price. Yeah, FIFA think, 17 is great value for we, money we every year. We talk shit about FIFA being bloated in terms of cost and the price of packs and stuff, but they've basically given us this for nothing. And it does link back to Ultimate Team, of course, because you get rewards that you can open in Ultimate Team, such as player packs and stuff for completing various parts of the journey. And then mm. if we're going to be a bit spoilerific, uh, you do get an Alex Hunter card at the end. I'm sure most of the internet knows by now, so... Yeah, I'm sure they know about the card. Based on how well you train up your your journey career, you get that representation in a card and ultimate team, which you know, at the highest level, you're not going to use it, but a really nice relic to have in your club nonetheless. So I was really pleased with that. Yeah, he's got a Stoke. He's placed a Stoke. Yeah, it's a Stoke badge as well, so I can like, link him up perfectly to Stoke players, which is sweet. <laughs> 
Yeah, because you're going to want to play Arnautovic instead of Alex Hunter, I reckon. Well, mine's a striker, so I, I need a striker. So it's like, uh, well, I, can definitely always, definitely. I can always position convert into somewhere else in the central line. So, yeah, overall, top stuff. Um, really looking forward to seeing it again next season, and hopefully it will get really expanded on more leagues, different scenarios, maybe make it a bit longer. Who knows? But God, can you imagine if they like really play out his career and we're going to be playing the journey for the next like 15 years? <laughs> really? I think they will do. I think they, they want to make it there, Rocky. Like, I think they've got a plan for everything. And I think good, good luck to them. I just, how, I just... how well did they time it, considering this is basically Marcus Rashford mode? And it's yeah, happening it's... in real life at the same time. So the more well he does in real life the more people are going to want to see how it translates to the journey next time around which is great I'm sure they're laughing all the way to the bank with it as well as getting plaudits from guys like me and you brilliant and with that Mets I think it is time to say you're patented yet stolen goodbye I think it probably is thanks for joining us folks I hope you enjoyed the journey as well and we'll be back Sometime next week with a full-length episode of Footstop, but until then, don't have nightmares.